Um, otherwise, he has promised to tell me to slow down. So, yeah, because apparently I speak very quickly. Um, even my father couldn't understand me. So today I want to speak to you about experiencing the real world, um, and really it's about multi-sensory VR. Uh, we've heard a lot about it from today. There was a very good question early on about it, and hopefully I'll help answer some of those questions. And it's all about trying to get in the virtual environment as close to the real environment as we can for a number of applications and a number of reasons. Um, the main reason is that, of course, with, with computer science and computer graphics now, you can create virtual environments very easily. It's not difficult to do that. Um, you know, it takes a bit of time and effort. We saw Cardi and quite a bit of maths, but you can create these environments. Um, but they can, if you try to use this environment to represent a real, a real environment, a real event, a real experience, it's very important that we get it right, because otherwise you end up experiencing the wrong thing. So if you're trying to use the virtual reality, for example, to make a decision on building a car, on cultural heritage, and if you have it wrong, um, if your virtual environment is not right, then you're making the wrong decision. So for me, and the, the, the main part of my research, is all about making sure that the realism is essential to allow us to have the right experience and therefore be able to recreate reality. Now, of course, you can use virtual reality for playing games and for movies and unreal things, uh, and that's fine. You don't have to worry about it. But if you want to use virtual reality to experience a particular environment, a particular event, then you have to worry about realism. It has to be accurate, otherwise you'll have the wrong experience and you'll be misleading. So, uh, so far so good? Come on. Okay, and the main thing then, when you start to think about experiencing an environment, is of course, you don't just see, right? Unless you've got some sort of impairment, some sort of disability, you, all your senses are walk, working all the time. Now, depending who you talk to, um, typically we talk about five senses. Yeah, visual, audio, taste, smell, and feel. Uh, but if you speak to psychologists, they will say there are nine different senses, pain, heat, uh, and if you speak to some psychologists, they say there are 21. And we don't need to go quite there. Um, but the important thing is that there are lots of senses that we are sens we're sensing the world with. And the other really important thing is that the senses are not independent. They interact with each other, so-called cross-modal interaction. And the simplest example of that is ventriloquism. When you're watching your television, you think the voices are coming from their mouths, from the people's mouths. But they're not. They're coming from the speakers. Uh, and that goes further. There's a restaurant in, in England called the Fat Duck. Have you ever been to England to the Fat Duck restaurant? No, I haven't been either. Um, if you go there and you order oysters, not my favorite food, but if you order oysters, they don't just bring you oysters. They bring you oysters and they bring you an iPod. And when you eat the oysters, you listen to the sound of the sea. Because the oysters will taste better, and they prove this scientifically, that oysters taste better if you hear the sound of the sea. It's a cross modality. The sound of the sea makes your brain expect the oysters to taste better, and they will taste better. So a lot of these psychological impacts happen, and this is what's important, because if you didn't have those senses, then you would not have that cross modality. So if you, if you did you know, virtual oysters and you didn't have the sound of the sea, it would not be accurate enough. So really, it's all about, in virtual environment, having the right number of senses uh, and getting it right so that this is the other. When you have a clear experience, you step into something unpleasant. When you're walking, you want not only want to see it and feel it, but also have that wonderful smell when you stand in something on the pavement. Um, and this is what I call real virtuality. So we talk, we, this day we talk about augmented virtuality, is what I call real virtuality. Obviously, a play on words, real uh, virtual reality is real virtuality. It's achieving a level of realism in the virtual environment, which you can then use to recreate real and, and past events. So what do we need to worry about? Some of the key conditions, I'll just go through each of the senses, um, what we need to worry about. So the light is very important. Okay? Your, your light of everything, is, as Connie mentioned in this talk, you know, the light of the same environment with different lighting conditions is seen very differently. This is some work we did at uh, uh, Cyprus. I do a lot of work with cultural heritage. This was reconstructing this Byzantine church. And you can see that the, this, the actual environment in the, the morning, at noon, and at dusk is very different. So if you don't want to have, it's not just light in the environment, you have the changing light depending on the time of day. We've done some work in cave art sites in France, just outside Bordeaux, a site called Cap Blanc. It's a, a cave art of, of a horse, a car of 15,000 BC. And if you look at it in the museum now, if you want the modern lighting, it looks, doesn't look anything special. But if you reconstruct that and you look at it under candlelight, this perception is very different. Again, and yeah, this of course, 15,000 BC, they didn't have modern electricity, they had candles. 
And so it's very important that the perception of that environment was affected by the lighting at the time. So what we've done is we've spent a lot of, a lot of time and effort in, in, our, in our visual part of it to get the light right. Um, and it turns out if you, if you look at candle lights, and you look at candlelight burning with oil or animal tallow or whatever you use, it's very interesting because if you look at this, can you see my cursor? No, okay. Um, on the, especially this, it's a sort of blue, yellow, or blue, green, red, if you imagine that. So what you can see is there's very little blue in candlelight. So you actually can't see blue in candlelight. Very, very, very poor to see it. Modern lighting, you can see all the colors. White light, we can see everything. But this with candlelight, we would struggle to see any blues to appear black. Uh, what's interesting in the bottom of one is that if you mix salt with, with oil, as the Romans did, you get a spike in yellow. Um, that you can see a little spike there. And that's what the Romans were using. For that. That's why Roman frescoes are mainly red and yellow. So if you look at modern art now, this is from the, this project we did with the National Gallery in London. If you look at modern artworks, you go to the National Gallery, they look very bright and very, oh, very almost too bright. Um, and it's under modern lighting. And then we, we did some eye tracking. If you look at that, with eye tracking, where you're looking, you will look at the halos because they're very bright, they really stand out. But if you look at that, not as we see it now, but as they saw it in the past, very different. And now if you do eye tracking, they don't look at the halos, they look at the faces because that brings the, 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 the soft glow from the firelight brings them into that. And you can see the blue is pretty much black because you can't know the blue of the blue candle. So your whole perception is very important, the lighting is very important. If you're trying to get, understand what the painting was like, not now, but back in the past, you need to make sure you model that light accurately so you have the right impression. Cardi mentioned as well, participating media. Uh, we've done a lot of work in Egypt. I guess it's a bit like Algeria. They take dust quite seriously there. There's an awful lot of dust in Egypt. Um, and so if this is a temple of Galapsha. If the light comes through that side there, it looks like this video reconstruction, it looks nothing special, but of course, there's dust in the air, and when the light came through, it gets dispersed and, and, and distributed, and you end up with this shaft of light. So not just as clear, it's actually a shaft of light. And you can see it, we did the simulation at different times of the day, this light moves because you can see it in the dust. So if you don't include the dust, it looks nothing special, it's just like a hole in the wall. But if you include the dust, and at different times of the day, you can see the shaft, and of course, at a certain time of the day, it illuminates a particular area of the temple, which was important. For the Egyptians. the Egyptians knew what they were doing, they were very good architects. So that too quick? So far so good? Okay. So that was visuals. Yeah, I'm going to give you a very whistle-stop tour. Um, I'm very happy to take questions at the end. The other thing of course is sound. Um, and you want to model sound in an environment, it's very important. Um, and there are many ways of doing it. Uh, this is one way that worked with a person, uh, David Howard, at York University. And so this is the York Minster, the big church. Uh, and every twice a year they clear out all the, all the, all the chairs, they do a clean for it. If you go in there and you fire a starting pistol, uh, you, get, you can actually work out how the sound propagates in the environment. If you close your ears, so this will work. And that will work out how the sound propagates from that point. Once you've got that information, then you can put someone back into that environment and you can hear how they would sound. So you put a soprano in there, as one does. And that's how she would sound in that position. Then you can take another environment. This is Hamilton Mausoleum. It's a very interesting environment because it's a box with a cylinder and a little half sphere on top. And what's really interesting is because it's, got, because it's an enclosed environment, we have this, we're not struggling to say, verber, reverberations, terrible word to say. Uh, basically, because you, well, the walls are quite close, we have a sound that just bounces off the sound and it actually lasts for 15 seconds. So if you fire one sound, 15 seconds later, you can still hear it because the sound's bouncing off all the walls. So if, whoops. Okay. Just because the sound, because the sound's bouncing on the wall. Now if you stick the soprano in there, you can, you, I suggest you close the, 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 the door quickly because she doesn't, she doesn't have walls. Because of the sound bouncing on the walls. So it's important, if you want to accurately recreate the sound of the environment, you need to take that into account. It turns out the best place to put the soprano in the need yourselves, if you want to sing, is a shower. The, if, so when my family complain on singing in the shower, it's because it's just for science, right? I'm doing research. And singing in the shower is actually the best place for acoustics. So I recommend singing in the shower. Etc. Um, of course, that's for the real environment, but you can do exactly the same with the virtual environment. So this is Coventry Cathedral. Unfortunately, it was badly damaged during the war. 
doesn't exist anymore. What did it sound like in the past? Well, you can create a computer model of it. You can do exactly the same thing. You can fire your impulse response function in the virtual model now. And then you can put the choir back in to the virtual environment. Not spot, it's not enough spot. And you can see what the choir might have sounded. Of course, we'll never know. We'll never know what's the past, what happened in the past. But if we did it accurately enough, we can at least have an impression of what it was like. Sound? Feel. Feel is a very difficult one. You don't mention about haptics. And that is the problem, is because the skin is our biggest sensor in our body. And when we sit down in all the whole of our environment, we're all affected by our skin. Um, so what we do a lot of the time is trying to, try to simulate how people sit down, sit, sit them down on a proper chair. So in our driving simulator, they sat on a chair. In our yachting simulator, they sat on a yacht. And then your, your body feels like you're in the real environment because you are in the real environment. So I guess a bit of mixed reality. Um, and it's important to get that right. But if, you're, if you try to simulate a chair with some sort of haptics or something, they're never going to feel right. But if you sit in a chair, it's reality. You sit in the chair. Uh, and then we also, you know, if you want to get any motion while you're driving, it's important to simulate any motion, any bumps on the road. I work with a wonderful cartoonist called Lance Bell, uh, who does all these cartoons to try and explain the concept. And you hit a bump in the road, and boy, there's some nice bumps in coming to the university, there's some really good bumps in the road. Uh, so this, we can develop a simulator for that. So that's feel, touch. Uh, but now we need to go further. So haptics, virtual reality, we've had visuals forever, we've had sound fairly recently, we've, now, we've had haptics for a while, the real world is more than that, we need to include the other senses, smell and, and, and taste. And so we've been spending a lot of time on doing that. And, and smell is really, when you get into it, smell is actually very, very interesting. We don't pay attention to smell. We, you know, it's happened all the time, but we don't really pay attention to it. But if we did, it would change our perception of the environment. It's one of the first senses that evolved in the body, which explains why there's no filter for smell. So we've got filter for, for sound and filter for light. We have no filter for smell. It goes straight into our nose, and our brain hangs in the top of our nose. That's the only part of the brain that regenerates. It regenerates, and there's no, there's no filter between the smell and your brain. Um, it also has a massive effect on your, how you perceive the world, again, from evolution. So it turns out, if a young man or a young lady smells good to you, you, know, you did, some people smell good, not without perfume, but perfume aside, but just the natural body odor, if they smell good to you, it's actually because the immune system is very different from yours. And of course, from an evolution point of view, you want people to get together. You have different immune systems. If you've got the same immune system, your children will be very sickly. You have different immune systems, your, cho your children will be much healthier. And so that's why, if someone smells good to you, it's because of that. There used to be a dating agency in New York that made you wear a t-shirt for three days. Then you have everyone do it, and you put all the t-shirts into cylinders. And then you go around and you first sip all the cylinders to see which ones you liked. And those are the ones that, 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 that sort of get you together with. But it's very important. So evolution has made smell part of that. Of course, it can affect your mood and things like that. Also, very interesting, it's most, most effective for memory. So smell is a much higher trigger of memory than any other of your other senses. And when I was doing this, we started doing this work, I got an email from someone, an 80-year-old person who lived in Coventry. And he said, yeah, he's, he's 80, he's retired, he's in a retirement home, and um, you know, he, every morning they gave him a boiled egg for breakfast, and it was a hard boiled egg every morning. And then one day they got it wrong, and they gave him a soft boiled egg. And the smell of the egg put him back in his mother's kitchen when he was seven years old. He could see his mother, he could hear his mother, he could smell everything. Perfect memory of that moment, just from the smell of the boiled egg. So very important. So, how do we create smell? Well, you know, so, so, first of all, so, so Interesting smell, because the same smell actually appears in different, different things. It's not just smell molecules, just chemicals. So any one idea what, what the smell of brie cheese, what they need, what, if you find that smell somewhere else, it's exactly the same smell molecules as brie cheese. Do you know what that is? Not quite. Smelly socks. <laughs> so, it's exactly the same smell molecules. So if you have a smell of smelly socks and brie cheese, it's the same. One's, one's a better smell, one's not the same. It's exactly the same as molecules. How do we capture smell? Well, it smells like chemicals. So unlike the, the, the audio and the visual, which is digital, we have to use chemicals for it. So you need a smell source. Uh, and so I did some work in South Africa, and this, this the gentleman there kindly gave a very large smell deposit. There's a run run to do a very large smell deposit. So what you do is you literally collect that, 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 that smelling material, if you like, 
uh, in, a, in a bag, and then you, the, the, on the top right hand corner there, you effectively you suck air from that smelly molecule into this device. It's basically, it's a, it's a metal tube with, with a sticky, sticky metal tube. It's just chemicals, the actual chemicals get stuck onto the tube. You put in a device called a gas spectrometer, and then you heat up the tube, and the molecules are released at different temperatures, and then you can record what they are. So the actual pink line on that graph is genuine rhino poo from a rhino, and the rest are different grasses that we, we made. So not surprisingly, rhino poo is actually very similar to grass. Not surprisingly. And then once you've got that, you can recreate that smell. This is your gas spectrometer, you can identify the different smells, and you can recreate it using chemicals. Now, leaving? Something I said? <laughs> um, the problem is, in, in, in the environment, you actually have lots and lots of smells. So, the smell of coffee has got 10,000 different smells in it. 10,000. But if, you want, if you're an expert in coffee and you really want to know that this bean was grown on this side of the hill in Colombia, in this valley of Wellington's farmer, you need the 10,000 smells. But if you just want to know it's coffee, you only need six or seven smells. And that's the big difference. Even though smell has a lot of stuff with molecules in it, Typically, for most applications, you only need the first six or nine most important smells, and you can tell it's coffee. Okay, so that's smell. And the one I'm working on at the moment is on flavor. Because yeah, often you see, you see something, what's it going to taste like? What's lunch going to taste like? You don't know, right? What's this jam in the shop going to taste like? How can you actually get that sense of the taste? Oh, voila, ah, oh, monsieur. Which one, that one? Hey, voila. Yeah, what does what fish and chips taste like in England? I mean, I wouldn't recommend it, but personally. <laughs> um, and so really, can we actually simulate so you can actually have an impression of a flavor before you, you have the meal? So if you know what lunch is like, oh, I don't like that, I'm not going to eat it. Oh, yes, I'm looking forward to it. Like couscous, you know, couscous. So, you know, um, yeah, what does it taste like? Well, I can, you know, with this flavor, which flavor, we can, we can tell that. Um, and it turns out, for, for flavor, there's only really five tastes. Sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and umami. Umami is like savory. Because flavor is actually 80% smell. If you take a piece of raw potato and raw apple, close your nose, put them in the mouth, they taste exactly the same. I wouldn't recommend it because raw potato is actually poisonous, but you know, if you want to do some research, sometimes you have to do this. Uh, if you release your nose, bang, you can tell which is apple and which is potato. And that's because of the, the texture and the taste is exactly the same. It just smells different. So can we recreate it? And we can recreate it. So there is the world's first virtual flavor device, which we developed. Uh, which basically has different cartridges for the taste, the smells, and the color. And what we do, I'm going to use this. So we take a real, real sample or something. We have a special device called a, well, it's basically a taste machine, which extracts from the real flavor the, the taste component, as a human would taste, and the smell component. Then you also some description about, this, about it, uh, called the flavor wheel, and you can put that onto a database, and then if you simply want to deliver it, these cartridges will effectively dispense the appropriate flavor. So you can see here we've got um, the glass one. We've got here. Yeah, we've got the what's that? Taste, aroma, and mouthfeel. Mouthfeel is like is it chili, is it astringent, uh, or is it oily? And so when, when you've got the combination from this device, it's simply this is just a recipe that you can then dispense the appropriate. We use food safe chemicals to recreate it. So for example, um, astringency is, is something like tannic acid. Sweet is just sucrose. Salt, sodium chloride, etc. So we use food safe chemicals, and according to the recipe, we can dispense the flavor. I can go to that in detail on that one. And what we've done, we're working a lot with, uh, with the Roybush tea. So it's a very healthy South African product, it's a little bit biased. Um, so we have to go to South Africa to get it, of course. Um, so this is what it looks like, it doesn't look that much, but it's been drunk for 3,000 years. It's a very healthy product, very good for uh, bone growth, etc. And again, we had the different versions of it, uh, we extracted the information. And you can see depending on which one it would depend on the, on the amount of information come from it. And then we had in, in Citrus Style in, in, Cape, in the North, Northern Cape, we did a, a, a user study to prove it. And you can also see that these are, this is the smell components of it, this is the taste component, and you can apply those. And this, this is the real and the virtual side by side. And so color is important as well when you see it. So it's not impossible to do. To recreate flavor, you have to just be able to extract the information and then use food safe chemicals to recreate it. Uh, so the project we did, um, for which also helped motivate, as usual with most of the stuff when you research, you have to work with the industry to get the money. And so Jago Land had a, big, had a big project, they're trying to work out what you could do in order to, um, how far could you get to design a car without having to build a car? So what could you do digitally? Um, and, you know, because it cost them a billion pounds to build a prototype. If they could do that digitally, they wouldn't have to do that. And again, you're, you're, you're basically, you've got, your experience is effectively the type of car that you're using. 
um, the actual environment you're going to be doing it in, and the type of person driving the car, boy racer or granny driving effects, and those you can give you the experience. And the question was how far could we go with that? So we had the environment, we created, the, and we captured the real environment, we had the model of the car, it was a huge number of polygons, uh, and then we could recreate the environment. Um, I'll just show you the, the quality, and what this goes back to Connie's talk earlier about the level of realism. So this is using very basic computer graphics, that's not good enough. Um, this is using slightly better graphics with ray tracing, also not good enough. Because you really want to worry, what they really want to know is what is the, what is the light reflection on the windows? Uh, the sort of, uh, and what are the reflections here? So this is the full, full um, scenario. Oops, just, and this, this works. This is, this is the model which is then computed, and you have the drive through. Uh, and we did, yeah, you can see that there. We have the, the, the shadow chain. We had um, the smell of the car, and we had the motion of the car, and we had the sound of the car, and, 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 the, and the visuals computed. Um, and of course, what we want to do is run this in real time. Because they want to be able to have the drive the car, and they say, okay, let's change the dashboard material. Let's make this maybe it's the, the light reflection is too much. Let's make it more matte and put that in. That's important. But, how do we achieve realism? We want we realism. We yeah, we are we, getting there. We're getting there. But how do we get this in real time? Well, as Cardi saw, we saw the mathematics equation this morning. It's a lot of computation. So how do we get this? Come back to exactly the question you asked now. The moment you put a human in the loop, it makes things so much easier because we've only got so much brain power. Okay, Cardi's got this much brain power, but the rest of us have only got this much brain power, and all your senses are competing all the time for your brain. Okay, so you have your visuals, your audio, you're trying to listen to me, you're trying to understand me. You really, a lot, of, a lot of your brain power is going into your ears to try and make you understand what I'm saying. You know, and maybe you're looking there with a visual. Maybe it does a smell of burning in, this, in, this, in, in now, and in the hall, you're like, well, you come into. So every, every moment in time, your brain, all your senses are competing, and you've only got so much brain, brain power. So you don't need to compute everything because the brain can't cope with it. And that's what we talk about. So you can have the same experience, even though we haven't calculated all the physics. So your perception of the environment really boils down to a few things. It's your preconditioning. So how much do you know about the environment already? And you know that when you drive somewhere and you drive back, it always seems quicker to come back because you used to bring some oh, driven down this road four hundred times. I don't need to worry about it. And that's why most accidents happen within four minutes of your house because your brain's not paying attention because you've seen it before. Also, the other thing is the human imagination. You've got an incredibly enriched imagination. I mean, Dungeons and Dragons was a show in my age now. It's a game which was played a long time ago. It's, a, it's an adventure game, fantasy game, all played in your, your memory. Four computers, it shows all that. Four computers. You used to play it in your, your memory. And someone described the environment. You're walking down the corridor, you can hear the sound of footsteps in the distance, there's water dripping down the walls, it's all stone, it's a bit cold. Your brain's filling in the gaps, right? You don't need a computer to tell you that. Your brain's doing it for you. Um, there's a very interesting project called Virtual Vietnam. Uh, which is run in America for veterans who are from Vietnam who post-traumatic stress disorder. And you can see the graphics were pretty poor. This is the 19, late 1980s. The graphics were poor, the sound was poor. But the, these veterans went in and had a very rich experience. And why is that? Because they were there. And as long as they had the right triggers, the brain filled in all the gaps. It filled in the heat, filled in the sound of the helicopters, etc., etc. Your brain filled in the gaps. Yeah, and they say, if you know if you something, you, you perceive less. The other key thing is, what are you doing in the environment? It makes a big difference to how you see that environment. What's all the so-called top-down <laughs> process of, of human attention? Um, where you actually focus, if you just walk into the environment, this environment, you don't know what you're doing, just look around, you will be attracted by certain things, what's safe. But if you're doing, you're coming to give a talk, then you're focused on that. And the same thing, if you're walking down the street, what you perceive in the street will be very, very different depending on what you're doing. So if you're looking for a street sign, you'll be focused on, on the sign, you'll be looking for the sign. If you're looking for a coffee shop, I don't know if Starbucks in every corner of, 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 of Rome, I suspect not, I hope not, um, then you're going to, you're going to be you know, trying to smell it. But if you're a military patrol in the environment, maybe in a hostile environment, then you're going to be the sound, you're going to be the sound of someone cocking their rifle or something like that. So the whole perception of what you're doing in that period of time, exactly the same thing walking down the street, your perception of time is very different depending on what you're doing. So as long as you know that you can create what I call the perception equation, which allows you to work out at any point in time what is the most important thing you're doing. Uh, and it's really just a weighted average of you know, the visuals, the audio, the smell, the taste, and the feel, and of course the brain is also distracted. Right now, you want lunch, how much longer is it going to go? I can't remember, you're, you're, you're sleeping, right? So actually part of your brain, part of the brain power is actually taken up by something completely relevant. You're thinking about, oh, 
what I'm going to have, what I'm going to do tonight, or whatever. When, 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 when can I next look at my phone? You know, all this. Yeah. And so actually, if you get that, you can actually work out at any point in time what needs to do. And then you can then use that as a way of calculating the thresholds of what's important at that point in time for your sense of what needs to be high precision and what can be much lower precision. Again, a lot more detail behind that, um, which I haven't got time to go into, but I'm happy to, to ask questions. And the example of this, so this is actually my brother. This is not my idea of a good time. This is my brother's idea of a good time. For me, this is like, no, 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 thank you very much. But anyway, he, he sells yachts around the world. Um, and so, and apparently, when you're, when you're on a sailor, if you're an experienced sailor, then you really, you're listening to the sound of the water on the hull is telling you how fast you go. Okay, so if you're computing a, an environment for an experienced sailor, you need to make sure you need a very high precision on the sound, because that's what they're using. If you're an inexperienced sailor, you don't care. Water on hull, we're not sinking, that's good. You know, can I smell the barbecue on the beach? It must be lunchtime. Again, so you have to know what you're doing in order to calculate. So it's exactly the same thing, again, different precisions. You have to know that to be able to do it. So again, very good with the tour. So, but the key thing for what we do, and this, I think this is absolutely important, if you're gonna do this, you need to validate. There's no point just saying, oh, we've got the physics right, it must be right. So a lot of our effort is all about doing the validation. So with the JLR project, we got the car to drive down a real environment, and we then measure people, skin conductivity, etc., heart rate of the real environment. And in the virtual environment, we've got the same thing. And we might be in a project running at the moment, we're going to do flight in a Tiger Moth. So Tiger Moth is one of these old biplane aircraft. And in two weeks' time, literally two weeks' time, we're going to take people up in this real aircraft, we're going to measure their heart rate, etc. We've created a virtual environment of the same thing, we measure the same heart rate, etc., and we can see how they correlate. So we have some objective measure of how close we've got. Because you can have questionnaires and all sorts of other things which are a way of measuring it, but they're never the same as actually, do people feel the same sense of tension and anxiety in the real and the virtual? So validation is very important. And you get you things like this to measure how accurate is the lighting in the real and the virtual. That's very important because otherwise you've just got something and you've no correlation between them. Just some examples of questions. I'm doing time-wise. Yeah. 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 Plus Delta? Plus, plus Delta. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. So, yeah, well, that was discussed. So, this work has come out of work we did in, in the cultural heritage. So, a lot of the work we did in cultural heritage. And why is a real so important? Because the past doesn't exist. In a real environment, now we do something for Jaguar Land Rover, we get a real car, we can drive a real car. If, if, if we try to recreate the past, we need to have confidence because archaeologists are going to use this to get car. This is a temple of Glabsha near Aswan. You can see in 1963, they built the dam and they realized that the thing was going to be flooded. So they quickly dismantled it uh, and then we created the virtual environment and we were trying to explore what the, what the past looked like. Um, and so we did a reconstruction of this. Uh, and really at this point we realized there's something very wrong with virtual reality. We can get the sensors right, we understand all that, but in actual fact, these sites, they never any, you look at any reconstructions, there never any people in them. Okay, and that's not what the way it was. And the problem is, of course, if you try to keep people in virtual reality, they never look right. Okay, we have evolved over 40,000 years to understand people. Okay, that's what keeps us going. We know what our mother, the first smell you learn, the, the very first thing you actually, as a baby, the very, very first thing you learn is the smell of your mother. That's apparently the very first thing you ever learn is the smell of your mother. You'll never forget the smell of your mother. Because obviously that's very important when you're a baby, because you are dependent on your mother. Um, but you know, any attempt to create people in a virtual environment looks terrible. Uh, and so all the models we did of, of virtual reality, you know, of reconstructing the past, Put avatars in it really has a negative effect on people's ah, oh, it's terrible. And it's because we all know it's called the so called uncanny valley. <laughs> so people just don't look right, and because of evolution, we have a negative effect. So you can watch a film and they can see maybe characters which are toys, like a toy story, you know, and everyone's happy with that. But the moment you put people in a virtual environment, we go, eh, and that has a negative effect. So what we've been spending a lot of time recently as well is trying to now improve real people into the environment because they're real, so they've got to look real rather than trying to model them accurately with subsurface scattering for the skin or whatever. But even though no matter how hard the games that NVIDIA will have tried, it's never quite right. So if you real people, capture them, put them into the environment, they're going to look real because they are real. And so we don't work on, on, on reconstructing Coventry, the city which is close to where I live. Uh, and so we had a real person come in. It turns out people do a lot of these reenacting of, of different activities. This lady does reenacting of uh, medieval dying. This is actually my office. Uh, this was a mistake because the, the, the materials they use for dyeing are not very pleasant, um, and there's a hell of a stink, excuse the language, 
Um, luckily, I was away at the time. My student was doing it, and, but, but the whole corridor, my my building, had to be have the windows open for a whole week because of the smells. Listen to it, um, because the smells are very unpleasant. But you can see, we can capture it in three D, and then we can put it into the virtual environment, and we're going to have plenty of value effect. Um, and so, how do we do this? Just very quickly again. So this is we use the thing called Connect. So the old Connect version two was okay, but the new one called Connect Azure. Slow down, thank you, Cody. Slow down. Um, so this is the master capturing things in 3D, point clouds in 3D. Um, difficult to get hold of because they're only available in America and China, but now we must get them. So we have four of them, uh, and you can use them now to capture any activity in 3D. Um, and so you have to have four cameras in the corners. You have to register the cameras, and then you can capture uh, objects in, in, in 3D, people doing real things. Uh, yeah, well, 3D point clouds, so, uh, video volumes, effectively, video volumes. Uh, so this is something we did on, on, on tanning, so this is something, again, very unpleasant. <laughs> medieval tanning is not particularly pleasant, but there are people who do tanning the medieval way. And this is down in the forest here, and this guy does it, he does it, the walks are the hide in the, in the, the scrapes, hides down, etc. So we went down there, you, you can see on the screen here the four different views from each of the cameras, the so that connects. <coughs> And again, you can see we can create them. You've got the code, and you can create your model as a point cloud. And now, again, you can put this into the virtual environment, and it'll look real because you've got know, any value. You don't have to worry about subsurface scattering because the light is done automatically. Um, but it's not that easy. Um, one of the big problems, if you try to capture with a connected, it's outdoors. The infrared cameras, so it's a big problem in ambient lighting. Um, so we had to create this tent around it to capture it. And the other problem is, of course, it's black material. Um, because, of course, it's using the light and it bounces light off, you can see that. You try to capture black in up the hole because the light just doesn't record on that. Uh, this is work in progress. I have a PhD student working on this, but it's, it's looking like we're going to be able to capture it. The main thing is we'll avoid the uncanny valley. So now this is, this is with some Morris Dante. This is a project that had with Cyprus and, and the University of Rennes, uh, one of my colleagues' colleagues, uh, to capture culture and heritage dance. Um, and so we had some dancers come in. We had a big problem with COVID. We couldn't get them in. We eventually got them in into our lab, and we captured them dancing. And hopefully, this will now play. Correspond. You can see the three D capture of the actual. That's, that's real. That's the model. <laughs> exactly. Make sure we get them up. It's great. Morris, Morris dancing. It's a very English tradition. Uh, very strange English tradition. Okay, so I want to leave plenty of time for the discussion. I'm very happy to answer questions. So really, the main thing is that yeah, if you're trying to recreate reality, you have to take into account the world is not lovely and clean with modern lighting, nice straight walls, not nice material. It's really typically dark, noisy, smelly. You know, if you want to take something, it's very complicated. Um, another thing, easy thing about realism is that you have to have people in the environment. You know, this, you know, most things you're always going to have someone in the environment, someone getting the, you know, get in the way or whatever. And if you want to try and create that experience, certainly you're trying to recreate the past, those people are a key part of it. You can't exclude the people. Uh, and therefore you need to get them as accurate as possible. Because otherwise you have this uncanny value and all your attempts at realism is then negated by the, by the uncanny value. Because of, um, of our human nature, innate negative reaction to, to avatars. Um, so really to avoid misrepresenting reality, in your virtual environment. To get the realism that Cardi talked about, you need to take all the things that Cardi mentioned, also you have to then make sure that they're dynamic. Environments don't, are not static. This environment is not static. I mean, the building is, but people are you know, in here, walking around, they're moving, whatever. It's important. Um, and that needs to, and it needs to be multi-sensory, because you need to be able to, even though the smell is, it's a constraint. There's a distinct smell in this room, right? You don't notice it, you get used to it, but you know, it's, it's having an effect on your perception. If you had a nice strong coffee, a really good strong coffee, that's affecting your perception. You know, the taste in your mouth, that's affecting you. Maybe part of your brain has been taken up by the fact you've got the taste of coffee. If you had orange juice, your perception would be different. So you need to take that into account. And so really what we're trying to do is achieve what we call um, this real virtuality. Even Star Trek holodeck, uh, if you're into science fiction, this is Star Trek holodeck. That's what we're trying to achieve It's science fiction, but that's really what it's about. We want to treat authentic virtual experiences as if you were there, as if you were actually in the environment, not looking at it from the outside, but you're actually there and you're experiencing it, all the sounds, all the sights, the smells, whatever. If you're drinking the coffee, you want to be able to taste the coffee, um, and that's what I call real virtual. Good, thank you very much. Thank you. Using the, the gas spectrometer, 
for the real taste, we can extract the real taste using the bars from China and from Japan. The inset effectively analyzes the taste and gives us exactly how the human tongue will taste it. And then we've got that recipe, and then we just put them together by using food safe chemicals. Um, so the UK's food standard agency <laughs> food safe chemicals. So we can use a chemical to recreate the smell. Just as well, it's a molecule, right? And you can recreate it with, a, with, a, with appropriate molecule. Um, if you're giving it to the person, though, the important thing, the way we perceive flavor, is we, when we smell in particular, is not only what's in front of the nose, but what's in the, what's in the mouth as well. So we have to make sure that when we do it, you know, even, at the moment we give it in a cup, you can have the flavor in a cup, if you can see you know, what, what it's like, what you can have. Or in the head mounted spade, we'll puff some smell in front of the nose, and you'd have the squirt of the taste in the mouth. We're not going to create a, a whole meal, but we're going to basically create the experience. So you know, if you're buying the jam, you're going to like it. Too often people buy a product and they ah, I don't like it. Well, they see it on the product shelf, what's uh, that's a lot of money I won't buy. So this will allow you to say, okay, that's what it's going to taste like. I'm not sure that answers your question. Was that, that sort of thing I might have done off the track of the question, but then. Okay, just ask you to. Slow down, slow down. End of my sentence, okay. So, but, uh, did, that answer, did that answer your question? So the, the thing is, yeah, it, it, it's. You know, it's not, we can't create, there are some people who have tried to create a taste with, with digitally. So if you put an electric signal on, on your tongue, if you take an electric charge and you put it on your tongue, you will get some sensations. So as the, it came out of Singapore, there's a, some chopsticks that you can eat with, and as you eat with it, they're electrically charged chopsticks, and as you eat with it, you have a sense of, of saltiness. If you, even a group in Malaysia that put electrodes up your nose to do smell, and they've used electrodes up your nose to, to simulate smell. Not recommended um, because you can damage your brain. And even the, the ones on the electric for your tongue, they use some sort of silver electrodes. There's only a limited number of tastes you can get because taste and smell is chemical. Um, but yeah, you can simulate the smell as long as you know what it is. You can simulate it with the appropriate number of things. And again, as we said before, a lot of it depends on the context. I and mean, your, your brilliant question early on is exactly that. You've only got some of the brain. So one classic example: I took some honey, whatever honey meal was in the fridge. And, and yeah. people couldn't see what it couldn't see, they couldn't see anything, they just had the smell. And I went around to people and I said, What's this? And they go, Oh, it smells familiar, but no idea. And I said, Buzz, <laughs> bang, honey. And that's the thing, you, so you, without that context, you, you, know, you can get away. So it doesn't matter how complicated the smell was, as long as you had the context, because you know, you're using all our senses all the time, and therefore you need, if you've got them all there, you don't need precision in any one of them. And that's, that's, the, that's exactly what they said, that's the secret. You've got all the senses there, because you've only got so much brain power, or cardiac so much brain power, the rest of the system has brain power, you, you, you don't need so much precision. Sorry, we're having a lot here. Thank you very much for your presentation, sir. So, uh, because it deals with senses, uh, which are very related to memory, uh, do you think, sir, that it may be, I mean, these technologies uh, may uh, or could uh, uh, do an impact to uh, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's diseases? Yeah, funny you should say It's exactly the project I'm working on at the moment. Um, so, um, the perception of Alzheimer's, well, so two things. First of all, yes, memory can be used. So one thing we look at is if you preserve the smell of the house before people move into the hospital, um, you pay the smell back and bring back the memories. But actually, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, one of the key things that gets affected, and COVID has done as well, is the loss of smell, the interaction of smell. Um, and actually we can use the flavor then as a way of monitoring, it's exactly the project I'm working on at the moment, and monitoring how the disease is progressing as well. So if I give you two flavors today, and you can tell which one's sweeter, but next week I give you the same two and you can't tell which one's sweeter, then something's happening to your brain. So it works both ways, you can use it as a way of monitoring and indeed diagnosing the disease, because something like Alzheimer's, and, or Parkinson's, are like diagnosed by cognitive tests, they ask people, can you remember? You know, when you get to a certain age, you can't remember anyway. I mean, so, but, but the, the actual onset of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's come here, but they're using cognitive tests, it's normally quite late, but there's, with the use of taste, um, it can be a bunch of really. And the other interesting thing is with COVID, COVID you lose your smell, and you can train it again, but long COVID is more interesting, because long COVID, you can lose your smell, it comes, it comes back, but it gets altered. Because you, and, and so what happens, something which smells, which was tasted or smelled good to you before, now it's, it's awful, and vice versa. So, someone asked me, chocolate before, lovely, now, terrible. And the worst thing is, so, that those of you who've got children, a children's nappy actually smells good to people now, because of long COVID. 
because they, they, they smell brains, pathways in the brain that have been altered by long COVID. So again, because we can measure the flavors scientifically, we can measure, this is what you think the flavor is, this is what the smell is, this is what it should be, and we can then correct for that. So understanding how people take these senses into account is very important. Thank you. Good questions. about the future and the present, 
but uh, not much people talk about the past. So is there like any project, any researchers that are working on recreating memories, especially that uh, with what the uh, neurology is doing for now with whatever like understanding the brain and understanding what we are thinking about? Is there like any uh, projects about or even like an idea about recreating memories in virtual reality? Okay, cool. first question first. So, first question first depends on the task. So your medical simulation, you need to speak to the people who are doing it and understand and get them to say the correlation to measure the real and the virtual and see how close the, the experience is. And you can't do that with a questionnaire because it's after the event. You want to measure it during the time. Um, it's not easy because, of course, yeah, they're focusing on the task. I would imagine yeah, it, it depends on how important that feel is for them to make a decision. It's all about decisions, right? They are cutting and they're going to make a decision how hard to push that knife to cut into someone. And they're going to, the resistance of the skin is making them make the decision. So you have to make sure that they make the same decision in the real and the virtual. So we had a, one of my PhD students working on medical palpation. We used the glove in the palpate. And by using sensors on the glove, we could record how an expert did it. And then you could record how the, the, the student does it. And you can compare the two. So I would, I would somehow use some sensors on the pressure sensors and record how it's done now. And then make sure that you then get those same pressure levels. And that's the way I'm doing it. Because at the end of the day, you know, without comparing the direct with reality, you, you could get it right or wrong. Um, so yeah, so certainly measuring pressure and everything, and, and obviously watching the real one, trying to work out how the skin is deforming, all that, and then use that in, in the right, and then get them to make the same decision. So in the real one, they make a certain pressure through the cut, in the virtual one, are they doing exactly the same? Are they making the same decision based on the sensory information that they, you know, to make a decision, you, 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 your brain takes all the sensors and say, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And that's how, that's the way to carry it. And you can't, there's no framework that's got to be based on, on the task. Yeah. So the next task may be completely different. Uh, and the only way to know is to work with the specialist. Right, the second one, what is the second question now? I'm getting old. About memory. So, I mean, there's the same to the earlier question. Certainly, capturing smell is a very important part of preserving memories. In fact, there's even a, a company in Sweden that sold these box of, of fragrance for of different smells. And, you know, you went to a wedding or something, you sprinkle around lavender. And then you, every time you had lemon, they had, you had to, of course, the problem is you get divorced. It's like, oops, you can't use that smell again. Um, so, yes, there are, there are certain ways, but yeah, smell is, as you say, it's a important part of memory that yeah, not many people do, but I, yeah, it's certainly been talked about now, actually going into environment, because you can capture smell. You literally do what we did with the rhinoceros. You simply take the tube, you suck the real air into it, that captures the smell, uh, and then you can recreate the smell from it. Um, and, and yeah, so you don't have, yeah, it's also, you know, so there you, Preserving. It was even, it was like, uh, I think there's some people now recording, you know, I think when, before Hong Kong independence, someone went around and captured a lot of air of Hong Kong and put it into bottles and he's now standing for large amounts of money. So you capture real smells. But the question is, when you run out of that smell, how do you then get it back again? So then you need to then analyze that smell and say, okay, we can recreate something which is close enough for that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think smell and memory has not been done. Smell is not just, not, we, don't, we don't do at all the smell. We just take smell for granted. And this, this is the perfume I worked with. He said that you know at school you do you do music for your ears, you do art for your eyes, but you don't do anything for smell. And if you trained your nose while you were at school, by the time you got to an adult, you'd have the same perception of, of smell as, as a dog, uh, just through training. But he suffered a lot, he had a very sensitive nose. If you, if you walk into an environment with a very sensitive nose, you can tell whether people have been smoking in there, you know, that they've washed for a while, and so you, every, every environment is really quite a, a nasty whiff of smell. So you, sometimes you don't really want to train your nose too much. Sorry, long answer to a short question, right? Okay. Alors on a deux questions après, la demoiselle, et puis après on passe à Paul, qui va poser la dernière question, et puis après on arrête. We should break to lunch before this question. No. Yeah. No, it's going to be a tricky one. <laughs> Sorry. Hello. Um, I want to ask, is it possible to use uh, virtual reality to help people overcome their phobia, such as acrophobia or fear of height? Absolutely. I mean, it's been done before. But the key thing, as I said earlier, is about the human imagination. It's getting the right treatment. So, doing the reconstruction of Iraq veterans, the graphics are not so great, the sound is not so great, but the smell of burning flesh is very high precision because that's the trigger. So, if you've got someone with the, the, the agrophobia, for example, is what is it? Is it the, the, is it the, the feel of the, the spider? Is it the look of the spider? Is it, so, that's what you've got to get right. If it's, you, you can look at a spider, you've got a problem. It's, feel of the spider, or the sound of the spider running, or the movement of the spider, so it's understanding what it is. But certainly, it's, but then you can expose people to it and gradually, you know, get them used to it. That's really what it's about, it's about exposure therapy. In reality, you can't even stick a spider in and like, 
Um, but you know, virtual reality, you put it in, you can make it bigger, smaller, and slowly get people used to it. So yes, I think acrophobia is certainly one of the, I guess one of, almost one of the oldest applications of VR, successful applications of VR. Uh, and it, yeah, it's been very successful because you can introduce it. This is a very good one they did on, on public speaking. So when you speak to the audience, you have a virtual audience, and the audience would get up and walk out virtually, right? And they went, oh my goodness. I had one, we had one with um, one of my PhD students was looking at getting people for job interviews. And then it became interesting, well, what was the most important thing in a job interview that, 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 that puts people off? And it turns out so we tried three different environments. We chose like a video of someone doing the interview. We did someone which was like an avatar. We tried to model it as accurate as possible. And then we had some sort of like cartoon character. And it turns out, actually, the cartoon character was better because the cartoon character, because we weren't paying so much attention to the details, how, how they responded, how, how, what the eye movement, how, they, how their body works. It's actually three body actions that are more important to people's react than, than the actual person sitting there. So it's understanding that that really makes a difference. So, yes, absolutely. I mean, it, it is one of the, you know, the, we talked about a lot of applications. Everyone, VR will be for everything. That's not true at all. The biggest problem with VR is still cyber sickness. People get sick in VR. I get sick very quickly in VR. So the car drive ahead is a real challenge. Um, so, yeah, but phobia absolutely is a very good example. Move to the next. The last question, please. Yeah, Paul? Yeah, that's actually one of my VR projects. You can decide to Okay. There's an example as we speak. Outside this is where the example goes in on a poster. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Tough question. The last right. question. Okay. The last question. Before lunch. No, okay, no, they don't even know what lunch was going to taste like. Right? If I get the birds of flavor, I can tell you lunch is going to taste like. You know where to go for lunch now, not. Sorry, put up, Paul. Go. I just had um, a eureka moment. Okay. And it's this slide. This this slide, um, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a brilliant slide. I think every student should make a copy of this slide. <laughs> um, well, why? Uh, why? Because um, this, the formula on this slide has been debated in philosophy until the modern day, going from Aristotle and Plato, Descartes, right to the modern day. And the reason why is because one of the biggest debates in philosophy and it comes into computing now too, is the debate between sensing the world, phenomenology, or experiencing the world. And uh, that's basically the data coming from the different senses. And many philosophers would argue for that approach, that you must take the data from the experience and the senses in the world. So in the formula, that's the the part that's got the A, the S, the T, and the F. That's the, that's that side of philosophy. Yeah. Now, there's another side of philosophy. Aristotle, Descartes, and others. They say, no, no. Don't worry about the experience of the world. Don't worry about the, uh, uh, the, the, the phenomenology. Um, it's inside your head, it's rationality, logic, rationality, everything is decided by logic and rationality. And this debate is going on in computing today. You've got uh, rule-based systems in, for example, AI, symbolic rule-based systems, that's the rational, the logic, Aristotle, Rick, uh, Descartes. But then you've also got all the neural networks, statistical, Bayesian, um, and, and interpreting speech and uh, um, uh, vision and so on. And um, so this formula is bringing both together because the preoccupation is the rational, it's the reasoning, it's the person's um, memory and history about um, which is stored. And that's the logical um, reasoning side, and and, and the formula is bringing both together. So it's um, and, and then it's using your reasoning and your logic to then uh, use the data from interpreting the the, the the smells, the audio, the taste, and the feel. But why? Why? Because to make decisions, to make um, to make decisions in the world. Actually, yeah. I mean, so this, this is a bit, a bit simple. I mean, so the problem with, with this this equation is that it doesn't take into account how the impact of the senses are on each other. 
Um, so we did some work before. If you have, if you're doing, we're just looking at precision. That's the precision question. If you have precision, and you can look at the precision of some graphics. If you have an unrelated sound, you, you can't see the detail of precision. If you have a related sound, you can see more detail of precision because the sensors are not independent; they do interact with each other. Which is why, if you have a, you have a mismatch of sensors, if one thing you expect to be something and it's actually something else, that can have a huge effect. So this is a, this is a good framework, but it needs a lot more. Yeah, you know, to really get it right. Again, you know, what are you trying to? What are you trying to do? We're just trying to use this as a way of for basic drive computation. We say we're going to compute this at high level, this at low level, because what's important for this point in time. But yeah, it's, it's certainly a good starting point. And the, the, the key thing is the distracting factor, because right now you're thinking about lunch going off. You know, we're not really paying attention. Uh, well, well, I, I got very excited. The reason why is because this equation leads directly to my talk. Um, so I put it in there. Yes. <laughs> good. Uh, well, well, thanks a lot. Okay, Thank you. Uh, Thank you.